Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event. And thank you for joining us here today to learn more about the transformation of Arch 42, a historic railway arch which will become a new public route through Nine Elms. I just want to start by saying what an exciting and positive project I think this is. It brings so much to the area, opening up a new route which will significantly reduce uh, journey times for pedestrians, um, which in the, in the essence of improving people's lives, those extra 20 minutes every day or extra 40 minutes every day are going to make such a significant difference. I also think it's really exciting, and I would say this, because we ran it as an LFA, London Festival of Architecture, design competition, which goes to crowdsource the most amazing design talent that's out there, not just in London, but internationally as well. And as part of that project, of course, it was won by the brilliant projects office, and we have uh, them represented here today to tell us more about that design. And I think that combination of award-winning design talent and improving the public realm is really a staple of our collaborations at the London Festival of Architecture with Wandsworth Nine Elms, as seen by uh, previous things like Thessaly Road, that some of you will be aware of. But today is all about Arch 42 um, and this exciting project. So just to tell you a little bit um, about the format for today, um, I'm joined by uh, three wonderful panellists who are going to set some context and, and tell you all about it. We're going to have a bit of discussion to pull out some themes and, and understand a little bit more about how this sits in the wider context, both historically um, and also in the future plans that Wandsworth have for this area. Um, and then there's going to be an opportunity for you to have um, some Q&A um, with the uh, panel yourselves. And then we aim to finish at 1 p.m. Um, so the panelists that are joining me here today are Councillor Ravi Govinda, the leader of Wandsworth Council, Hilaire from the Battersea Society uh, Heritage Committee, and James Christian from uh, Projects Office. So I'm going to start by uh, handing over to uh, Councillor Govinda um, and really asking uh, Ravi, you, you must have seen some really enormous change uh, over your time at Wandsworth. Um, you've obviously been involved in the area for a very long time. And I wonder if you could set some of that context out for us, um, how this sits within, within the, that historical and future, future change. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tamsin. And uh, I'd sort of say that imagine this area as it used to be. Uh, it is, and there you are, you see an image of what it was. It is full of more post-industrial warehouses, many of them not operating at full capacity. And at one end, the decaying hulk of Batsy Power Station. There were always e strong east west links between central London and the wider southwest running through this area, linking the rail tracks to Waterloo and the road links to the bridges at Chelsea and Vauxhall. Less than 12 years ago, we started the process to change all of that. 227 hectares between Lambeth and Chelsea bridges was to become Nine Elms Opportunity Area with the objective of better linking it with the nearby central London to become central London's new urban district. And that vision is being delivered now and delivered at some pace. And a new urban district is a place on a place making on a massive scale. To make a success of it, a strong public realm was strategy was critical. Making connections was fundamental feature of the frameworks of public realm strategy. And the two key objectives in the opportunity area framework, I'd quote, are at work to improve access for communities south of the opportunity area to facilitate and facil to facilities and opportunities within the opportunity area and to the river. And the way of delivering this was to activate the railway arches throughout the opportunity area, including opening up key arches to enable new pedestrian connections in line with the overall public realm strategy. There were very few north-south links and what there were were hostile and unwelcoming and that's all changing as well. Uh, Tamsin, you mentioned earlier about, about Tassily Road Bridge. So in summer 2019, we celebrated Inca Ilori's transformation of this dark and dismal space to a happy street. And we now turn our attention to Arch 42, another dark and dismal space. And in fact, now not even a link. We want the same uplifting transformation of Arch 42 as we achieved at Tassie Road. 
opening up and transforming the art will meet the two key objectives, which I read out earlier. We want the residential community south of the river to have that, which have always been cut off from the river without any gateways to, uh, they would remain cut off from the new facilities and opportunities. And Arch 42 will address that shortcoming. We want also the arch, we have two way process to build uh, and to act as a bridge building between the old and new communities. And this is, so the, the, the arch 42 as it will be, will, will do exactly that. This is not only a north south linkage that is being promoted in the area. The gateways through Batsy Exchange already provide better alternatives to the hostile and heavily trafficked Batsy uh, uh, street roads. We are committed to opening up the underpass uh, at Stewart's Road to uh, provide easier access to the power station. And making success of the area's regeneration relies on a wider package of new connections. And the council, once the council's delivered, and work with vigor and imagination to deliver the Northern Line extension, which will open in about five months' time, roughly in time with opening up the Arch 42. There's a new riverboat pier. There's a massive reconfiguration of the road network to create better and safer space for pedestrians and cyclists. A new riverside path linking all the way from Lambeth Bridge right the way to Batsy Park. And a swathe of new parkland linking the historic parks of Spring Gardens and others at one end to, to the Batsy Park at the other end. And this is not just physical connections. This is about connections with the communities too. The council has delivered a cultural infrastructure in the area, creating opportunities for several of our uh, cultural, existing cultural institutions. World Heartbeat Academy, Chocolate Films, Theatre 503, Batsy Art Center, all of them have benefited from, from linkages in the area. As have many schools through the Power to Connect initiative between the council and, 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 and Batsy Power Station. But you know, there is a lot more to do. There is much, much more to do, and, and, and we will continue to deliver on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. So, Hilaire, the, the railways and the connections that they brought historically were really critical to the development of this area historically. But of course, as, as Ravi's outlined, that they the actual heavy duty nature of that infrastructure as well as creating opportunity creates obstacles. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how that's developed um, in this particular setting. Sure, thanks Tamsi. Um, so in the, the early 19th century, sorry, if we could have slide one up, please. Great, thank you. So in the early 19th century, Nine Elms was a semi-rural and sparsely populated area. By the end of the 19th century, it had become heavily industrialized district with pockets of housing squeezed between railway lines, viaducts, gas works, and other polluting industries. The arrival of the railways mid-century was a key factor in this transformation. So the London and Southwestern Railway Company's Southampton to Nine Elms service, shown here running from bottom left up to the ter terminus near the river, was fully operational by 1840. Nine Elms' largest farm, Long Hedge, was cut in half by the line. Smaller farms were also affected as the railway embankment made it difficult to move stock around. The London South Western Railway soon decided to move their terminus closer to the West End and an extension to Waterloo was completed in 1848. For the first quarter mile east of Nine Elms, the tracks were laid on an embankment and then carried on a viaduct to Waterloo. It's estimated 80 million bricks were used in building the viaduct. At this stage then, the section of the viaduct that Arch 42 is located in hadn't yet been built. Nine Elm Station closed to passengers and became a goods depot with engine sheds and railway works also housed on the site. As the company continued to expand, so the need for larger works grew. In 1861, they purchased 30 acres of market garden land south of the main line extending almost as far as today's Thessaly Road. Locomotive and carriage sheds were built on the eastern section of this land. By 1876, the Nine Elms goods depot was short of space. The company decided to move the main line south to free up space and also to raise the line at this point onto a viaduct. 
This was a huge operation involving removing the mainline embankment and locomotive depot, constructing a viaduct and building a new locomotive depot. Several hundred artisans and labourers worked on the project, which was completed by July 1878. Slide two, please. So the viaduct, which you can see at the top of this map, consisted of a series of brick arches with skew lines underneath to connect the north and south yards. The arches were used by the London South Western Railway for various purposes, including storing materials, locomotive paint shop, bricklayers and blacksmith shop. Arch 42 was used as stables at one point and for carriage lifting fitters, amongst other youth things. Slide three, please. Adjacent to the new viaduct on, uh, that was the Ponton Estate built in the 1860s, as well as the railway, it was hemmed in by Nine Elms Brewery, the gas works and Nine Elms Lane. Known as the island, it was notorious for its slum conditions, but survived for over a century. Between 1891 and 1922, Charlotte Despard lived here and ran her Despard Club from Curry Street, working to improve the living conditions of her neighbours. Charles Booth's poverty map shows the streets of the Ponton Estate on the left-hand side of the screen as predominantly lowest class, vicious, semi-criminal and very poor chronic want. Whilst the streets south of the railways works on the right hand side are primarily classed very poor with a few shown as lowest class. Nine Elms was by now crisscrossed by railway lines and viaducts from its eastern corner to the infamous Battersea tangle of lines between today's Battersea Park and Queenstown Road stations. This created other islands of housing, a legacy that's persisted with the sense of states being isolated and not connected to a wider community. Viaducts also cause specific nuisances for residents, such as noise, vibration and pollution from trains passing close by, often at bedroom level. In 1968, the Nine Elms Works closed and the site was later redeveloped for New Covent Garden Market. Before the market was built, children from nearby streets played in the empty arches and signal boxes. The final scene of the 1971 film Villain, starring Richard Burton, was also filmed in the disused arches. These were later leased to the Covent Garden Market Authority for 99 years. Most recently, a mechanic was working out of Arch 42 and prior to that, a fruit and vegetable seller. And now it's going to have a new lease of life. Thank you so much. That's uh, really fascinating. I've got loads of questions <laughs> to pick up later. Um, but obviously, um, we're here to talk specifically about Arch 42 now, um, and TFL, as um, some of you will know, um, have endeavoured to open it up and to make it a, a safe um, public uh, access route, uh, making it usable and, and lighting it, etc. Um, but this competition was run to make it more than that um, and to make it a much more significant contribution uh, to the local area, um, which of course Projects Office uh, then won. So I've obviously seen the winning scheme, but I haven't seen it for a while. So I'm absolutely fascinated to hear more from James about uh, how it's developed um, and where you are now. So over to you, James. Thank you. Okay, so, um, yes, as Tamsi mentions, our proposal, um, which we provisionally called Tunnel Visions. Um, we were lucky enough to, to win the Arch 42 competition um, back at the beginning of, of this year. Um, and yeah, as, as Councillor Govindia has, has mentioned, this is a really important strategic route um, that builds on the success of the work done by Yinka Alori at Bessley Road and creates a second strategic link north-south connecting these two quite distinct areas of the, the, the new um, regeneration zone to the north and the existing communities and new Covent Garden market, and importantly, the, the nine, new Nine Elms London Underground Station to the south. As, as you can see from Hilaire's presentation, the, the history of this area is really fascinating because of the sort of distinct identities of the place through, through the years. And 
when exploring this at the kind of initial conceptual stage of, of the competition entry, we were kind of struck by how the, the railway has been this kind of one continuous um, sort of landmark uh, throughout these years and years of, of change. Um, and it is a, it is a barrier, um, but it's also something that, that we felt could be kind of celebrated as this kind of consistent thing that, that has remained there throughout all these years. Um, and on these two maps, um, I've marked where Arch 42 is. So we see in, in 1893, the, the locomotive works to the south and, and the goods depot to the north. Um, and now today, uh, linking the, the new um, regeneration zone, the new US embassy um, and Ponton Road to the north and connecting that to the new Covent Garden market site to the south and then to the new um, Nine Elms London Underground Station. So we decided that we were going to sort of place this railway heritage um, sort of centre stage of, of our proposal and, and really celebrate that um, with our, our scheme. Um, and we sort of interpreted that in the form of this sort of iconic um, sort of architectural signifier that you find on, on in, in railway infrastructure, and that is the, the dagger board. So each railway company would have their kind of own sort of distinct identity of dagger boards. And we thought that it would be really interesting to work with the local community to actually design dagger boards for Nine Elms. So we proposed a series of these paper cutting workshops for local schools where we asked the children to kind of consider um, their place in history and actually through the workshop, we worked with the, the kids at um, St. Mary's, St. George's and Griffin Primary School uh, to sort of think, well, actually, they are part of history and they too can make a mark on history. Um, so we asked them to sort of think about their walk to school and, and sort of come up with some series of symbols that represent the, the places where they live. Um, and we have literally got hundreds and hundreds of these really beautiful dagger boards um, designed by, by the school children um, that we will be incorporating into various parts of the, the new structures um, that we're currently working on. It's not just being limited to local kids. Um, it's actually, you can, you can do this at home. Um, as part of um, the London Festival of Architecture, we have a home workshop uh, video uh, that you can access visiting the Nine Elms London website. Um, and you can also download a DIY dagger board worksheet. Um, and there's a competition uh, to get your dagger board featured in the design, which I think closes next week. So uh, if you're very quick, you can, you can still get involved with that. Um, but yeah, please do watch the video and you'll see Megan explain the process of, of how to make one of these dagger boards at home. So yeah, this is a, a strategic route um, and the, it sort of links two areas with quite distinct identities. Um, so the south side on the new Covent Garden market site, I mean, for us as architects, we find this fascinating because it's a working market, uh, the viaduct, it's messy, but it's very visually interesting, um, but it's also a very busy structure there's a lot going on, there's a lot of businesses, there's a lot of kind of hustle and bustle um, around the area. And we felt that um, it's quite difficult to sort of navigate that site as it is. So we felt that we needed to kind of make a proposal that was kind of very singular and very clear and very obvious that really made it sort of abundantly apparent where it is you should go to get to the other side. So we've created this railway tunnel inspired South Gateway. Um, so as you sort of walk from the Nine Elms tube station through the Covent Garden market site, you know exactly where it is you should go. It's sort of, you don't need signage, it's, it's just there. It's obvious that there is something exciting on the other side and, and, it's, a, and it's a route through. And this has to be true 24 hours a day. The, the market operates throughout the, the day it operates at night, um, but it's important that people can can walk through safely at night. 
so we will be incorporating light into the design as well. The structure itself, referencing the, the dagger board, uh, will be made of layers of cut timber. Um, so these, these flat layers of timber together build up this kind of three-dimensional sculptured volume um, made up of sort of simple dagger board structures. Uh, the, there'll be some dagger boards designed by the community that you see at eye level as, as you walk through. Um, but over on the other side, things are a little bit different. Um, this is an, a new piece of city, um, and there are sort of slightly different set of um, conditions here. So the viaduct itself is, is a masonry construction. Uh, it's more conventionally what you would expect for a, for a railway viaduct. Um, and on this side, it's more about sort of the, the long view um, as you walk around the American Embassy uh, on Ponton Road. So over here, we've proposed a simple gateway structure to the viaduct itself, uh, a decorative fence, and also, very importantly, this totem. And the, the totem will be a structure that you sort of see from, from a long way away. It's, it's like a kind of beacon in the distance, and it's, it's visible all the way down Ponton Road. And this will be the uh, kind of the, the iconic structure that features the, the dagger boards that have been designed by the local community groups. So we're, we're busy working on the designs and um, we're just about to submit this for planning. We've been working a lot with various stakeholders such as Network Rail and uh, New Covent Garden Market as well as the, the school kids um, and we're sort of busy developing the design. So these are the latest versions of the the visuals and I'm pleased to see that pleased to say that actually the intent we've we've kind of made been true to, to the original intent of, of the project. So here you see sort of from slightly further distance away the, the north side of, of the viaduct. And then over on the south side we're developing the scheme as well uh, to work with the constraints of the viaduct structure and the requirements of network rail. Um, and yeah we've we're very excited about how the, how the project is, is developing and uh, are hoping that, um, that it will be open um, on target this autumn when the tube station opens. Thank you, James. That was great. And it's looking, it's looking great. It's developing um, really, really nicely. Um, well, I'm full of questions, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, start. Um, one thing that um, I just wanted to follow up on, uh, maybe with James and, and with Ravi, both of you mentioned the involvement of young people in schools, um, James specifically in this project, and I know that's very much part of your practice. Um, but Ravi, you, you also more broadly in some of the other things that are happening. Um, I wondered if you could start maybe by just telling us a little bit more about some of that, and then James, maybe you could tell us a bit about the specifics. Um, for your uh, so, thank you, James. I mean, there has always been a community on the edges of that, this industrial area. And it, 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 when the area became a wasteland, there were still existing communities in Patmos, Savannah. The two, three schools that James mentioned are all within walking distance of this regenerating area. It was important for us from the very beginning to say to children that their future is being shaped in their neighborhood. They need to be part of actually influencing some of the outcomes of the, the, the new neighborhood that's developing. So firstly, I must say, that James, thank you for, for actually telling me that these pieces of wood on a railway canopy are called dagger boards. I never knew. So that's a bit of learning uh, this morning I cherish for, for a while. But in a, you can see the imagination of the children have embraced that idea of getting involved. Earlier, there was a project where they created lanterns and they took in, a little snake of uh, children with lanterns all the way from the estate to the river to celebrate some of the mythical creatures of the river as a part of them getting to know the, the area. And there's been a continuous involvement of schools in visiting the con construction sites to learn more about both construction projects. Quite apart from that, we have had a number of children look at and from wider than just the immediate neighborhood, look at opportunities in the construction industry as a part of their learning and their making choices for the future. So it's not just getting excited by big diggers, 
but actually making sure that they have possibility of making a career out of this. And in the meantime, having fun uh, cutting out pieces of papers to, to, to help James and his compatriots come up with the right designs. And Yinke Lori did some, something very similar and you know, got, got children very excited by primary colors and how they use primary colors to inform his uh, color palette. Yeah, I think we have, as a practice, we've, we've always wanted to sort of, um, we, we, we work with kids to sort of show that, I guess show that, that design as a career exists um, because it's, it's not necessarily something that is kind of immediately apparent when you're sort of eight or nine years old. And by, by working within a school, we can sort of be like, we're architects, this is what we do. Our job is very important because it, it makes a mark on, on places. Um, and, and then we can sort of continue that. Um, so by, by working on the, 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 the architectural projects that we do, we can work with kids to actually say, well, actually you can make a mark on your environment as well. Um, and I think it's always been really kind of key for this project, for the idea that actually we've been working with mostly with um, year, so year two and three, um, sorry, I think year three and four um, kids. I like, they, they can make those dagger boards and they can walk through that archway every day and see the, the dagger board that, that they made. And this structure has a design life of sort of 20 or 25 years, hopefully longer. And I, I love the idea that actually someone will be walking through as an adult maybe with their own children and be yeah. able to say that was, it's just the shape, but it's a shape that's still there 20 years later. Um, and, and that was a mark that they were able to make on the place where they live. Sorry, I think that's lovely. I think that's, that's a really nice um, sort of touch um, that get, got sort of pulled out it's very much kind of integral to the design as well. Um, just picking up on the dagger boards, going to Hilaire and, and maybe then to, to Ravi, I, I always think that um, when people think of this area and they have a kind of iconic image or symbol of what it is, they always think of the power station. It's so preeminent in everyone's minds and, you know, rightfully so. Um, but actually you sort of drew out for us, um, and as you walk around the area, it's apparent how important the railways were um, and still are to the area and what an impact they make. Um, and the dagger boards are obviously something that, that James has um, picked up on, but I wondered if you had to create your own sort of, instead of the power station, something that symbolised the railways or Nine Elms in, in that way, what your sort of thoughts on the kind of architectural components are. Um, I guess, well, I have to say also, like, like Ravi, I hadn't heard of the dagger board, well, I didn't know the name for them until I started looking at, at the, the design that Projects Office had come up for. So that's great to know that, that little bit of terminology. And I think, I mean, where I, where I live, which is on the other side of Queenstown Road from, from the Nine Elms area, um, what I see from my, my window is, is a, a viaduct and, and, a, and a railway arch. And I love that view. So but it's kind of until starting to do the, the research for this and think about this, I actually started notice, really noticing the viaducts. And, you know, there's, there's a viaduct going through the new Battersea Exchange development as well. And the viaducts that have opened up und, um, bar, next to the power station site with the turbine theater and some, some restaurants and so on. So I think, th I think that actually the viaducts are really quite, you know, they're a big part of Battersea and especially the, you know, the the end that I'm at, which is where that huge tangle of railway lines in the mid 1860s came into being. So the, the railways were, they were here before a lot of the, the, the population was, you know, they were, they were coming in and, and they were the priority. And then the building of, of housing and so on came after that. And, and Ravi, do you... Yeah, Tamsi, I mean, I think, I think Hilo is right. I mean, railways are such an important part of this area. There are three railway stations in a kind of triangular formation, Batsy Park, Queenstown Road and Vauxhall. There are hundreds of lines running through it. I mean, it's like sinews running through the space and they are at various levels. And, and I think what will be interesting 
about celebrating the railway heritage is when we get closer to the railway heritage, because a lot of this heritage has been locked away from people because they're surrounded by industry. Just take Bats, the, the Covent Garden Market, all these arches, workers of Covent Garden Market touch and feel them every day, people don't. And I think once we are able to touch and feel them and see what they do and how they divide and how they create opportunities, will be an interesting way of celebrating the past and bringing in the future. And one of our aims is that the arches as they open onto the northern side of this main viaduct, it should provide some space for some sort of interesting and gritty uses. And, and there are cultural institutions and there's no reason why a kind of foundry studio can't happen in one of the railway arches. There's no reason why a picture frame I can't uh, set up shop and, and provide both jobs as well as something uh, uh, sort of artisan work, work. So there is really life in, in this new arches providing both a link with the past and, and something to, for the future. And I think that that's a very, very strong part of, uh, of the area's heritage. Thank you. And I guess sort of slightly following on from that and some of the things we've been talking about, one of the things I've heard mentioned a couple of times is this idea of the Nine Elms aesthetic um, and with the Morag Myerscroft um, installations and art pieces up at the, the river around Battersea and obviously Yinka's piece down at Thessaly Road. Um, and I would say brought in the broader sense, the, the projects office um, commission, I guess falls broadly within that sort of uh, aesthetic grouping. I wondered what, how you felt, James, of being part of this, this movement of this and defining this area in this way. I think, um, yeah, obviously we're, we're very flattered to be uh, sort of named alongside um, Yinka and, and Morag. Um, and, um, but I think for us, it's sort of, we, we want to make sort of places legible and clear. Um, and I think for us, sort of the, the, the kind of the, the colour, um, I mean, we use colour a lot in our work, but here it's, it's about a sort of single colour um, to just be this sort of really obvious, here is a landmark, it's a place you can go, it's a, it's a place that opens you, it's a gateway, um, it's a route through. Um, and I think that we've enjoyed with this project the, the kind of the play between sort of something that is kind of quite quite bold and, and pop um, that also references that that railway heritage. Um, I mean, because I think we we think the landmark is uh, the, the um, viaduct is such an important landmark to to the area. Um, I mean, we loved sort of learning about the, the Battersea Tangle, as it's known. We discussed that with some of um, Hilaire's colleagues at the Battersea Society. Um, and um, and we think that needs to be celebrated in the same way that you would celebrate a river or a mountain range. Um, it's it's sort of it's something that's that's there. It's 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 a part of the landscape. Um, and yes, it does have its sort of negatives in the form that it, it creates boundaries. But but by making it porous and permeable, and inhabited with new new businesses, as as Councillor Govindia has has said. Um, it can sort of become something that is sort of really kind of makes the identity of, of a place. And Hilaire, from the, you're obviously here representing the Battersea Heritage Society, uh, sorry, Society Heritage Committee. How, how do you kind of feel about the new aesthetic and how do you feel it sort of works with the um, historic setting? Um, I, I mean, I like, uh, you mentioned Mara Myerscough's entrance into Battersea Power Station, which I really like, and I hadn't made that connection, but I think, yes, the, 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 the colour and the vibrancy of the, the, the project's office design does, does kind of fit with that, and it definitely brings something, something new to the area, but, but it kind of, it, it, it also links together with other parts of the area. Um, and so I hadn't, you know, it was only a few years ago that I discovered that actually you could walk through Covent Garden, New Covent Garden Market, and there was a, a pedestrian route, except it took you back out onto Wandsworth Road. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to being at that, that e extra permeability that, that hasn't existed for such a long time. 
And uh, Ravi, are you enjoying the new, <laughs> this new colourful identity? Yes, I think. Very, very, very much so. I mean, I think I always felt that, uh, you know, the, the area is so vast that it has got space and room for all manner of things that both uh, bind it together as well as celebrate little bits. So, I mean, you, you mentioned the Elorian Morag pieces, but there's a pavilion on the riverside, which is also taking up some of the kind of yeah. colorfulness and the playfulness. Or, or that that Ian Ken Morag have, have brought to the area. So I think I think there are there are bits all over scattered. I hope in time, which will sort of uh, create a uniformity as well as difference. Mm, and almost a sort of route through and around the area. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and you know there'll be time that you know you, you might almost create a kind of uh, you know take a route through and walk walk past these milestones, uh, both in terms of what they celebrate, but what it, what they also represent. Absolutely. And, and just a reminder to the audience, there is an, an opportunity for them to submit questions as well. But just reflecting on um, what Councillor Govinda just said, I think this um, general approach to commissioning arts and culture within the area and supporting um, some really interesting arts and design practitioners is, um, is extremely positive and very interesting. And I wondered Ravi, if you had any sort of reflections on that, and I know the cult, some of the cultural institutions that you're you're bringing in a part as part of that as well, it seems to be creating real identity for this area. Yeah, I mean, I think so. So every every developer is required to create uh, to to make an arts and cultural contribution, not only to their own uh, development area, but also to inform the rest of the area. And I think we in the in the kind of nine arm strategy team have had. A, the job of making sure that these individual contributions are linkable and they are meaningful and yet remain diverse and different. So, I mean, the, the Batsy Power Station will create a lot of uh, space where there will be installation type of art, but actually there will also be performing and in, uh, and in, in the same, uh, performing arts. So they already got a theater, they already got a cinema. So those kind of things. I'm, I'm interested that the designs of the buildings themselves make a contribution to the cultural strategy for the area and celebrate both what's coming and in places what, what's been uh, there before. So the Spire, Squires scheme for the Batsy Gasworks site uh, takes on board some of the shields of the old, old uh, gas holders and puts them into the, the, the new design so that they create that link with the past, but also uh, uh, and, and the squires pen, campanile probably harks to the height of the gas gas holder that used to be in that sense. So it's always there's always the need to get that playfulness of both design uh, to celebrate what was there, but to also celebrate a kind of new opportunity to be creative. Thank you. So James, back back to your. Uh, design and the specifics of it. Um, you talked about the totem um, and you didn't expand uh, very much on that, but I thought that would be interesting if you, if you were <laughs> willing. Just tell us a little bit more about the thinking behind that and how that sits within this sort of historic industrial context. Yeah, I mean, the, the totem for us has always been about showcasing these dagger boards that that are designed by local people um and we it's a sort of it's quite a complex site really um it sort of seems simple but the more you you kind of explore it it's 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 quite sort of it's not a straightforward sort of straight line route through and as we were sort of working through the the kind of the early design process we we kind of initially came to the conclusion that, that we should be making these, these big gateways that are made of layers of, of dagger boards, but actually that didn't really work on the north side um, because the north side features a, a ramp. Um, there is an existing London plane tree that uh, Wandsworth Council are, have been working very hard to protect. Um, and we felt that actually a sort of a series of objects worked better on that side and we really thought about you the, the sort of view 
along Ponson Road, particularly at night, um, you, you can't see Arch 42 as you walk around the, the embassy. So in order to kind of make sort of smart use of, of the resources, and this project is no different to any other, the resources are, are limited, the budget is limited, we felt that actually a, a sort of collection of objects worked better. And by creating a, a totem instead of a sort of second kind of grand gateway, we were able to kind of create a landmark sort of earlier in the process so that as you walk along the road, you see the totem and you, you know that something is, is up there. It's not just sort of uh, back, back railway land. Um, and then as you sort of approach that totem, you can turn the corner and then you see the entrance to Arch 42. So it was really sort of about a sort of having a, a slightly different approach to the language of, of the design um, to, to kind of work with those conditions on, on the north side. So I guess, in, in essence, there's something that's kind of beacon-like about the whole proposal um, that you're making. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, um, I mean, the, we, we sort of have selected this, this orange colour um, and I'm not going to lie, there's no sort of sophisticated colour theory behind that. It's because orange is a, is a warm, it's a friendly colour. Um, but it does have that sort of slight beacon, that slight lantern-like quality. And these structures will, will incorporate lighting um, and they will glow at, at night. So there will be these sort of warm, bold, welcoming structures, these, these beacons, as you say, um, in, in the distance. And we really want people to feel encouraged to sort of explore and, and walk, walk through and, and then it, and kind of enjoy the connections um, either side of, of the viaduct. I'm slightly disappointed you're not going to retrofit an archie speak uh, <laughs> explanation of the colour orange, but I admire your honesty and I certainly think it will absolutely do that. And I think um, sometimes you just have to be instinctive about these things. And I think colour is, is, is very much that. You have an instinctive response. Hello, I wonder just touching on that idea of beacons and, and this site, some of your plans that you showed, um, particularly the sort of booth maps, it, there, it, it sort of illustrates how illegible certainly um, things used to be. Um, and obviously there is still a, a legibility issue with some of these routes, um, particularly during construction phases, but, but just generally. I wonder what your thinking is about sort of strategies for that within this historic context. And you're obviously a resident as well as, as a <laughs> historic expert in that. Mm. Yeah, so I think you can see from those maps just how dense it became around, concentrated around the railway and little pockets of housing. So the, the Ponton estate, the, where um, the Curry Street, Woodgate Street, which was known as the island, was also described by one of Booth's um, investigators or researchers as impenetrable. So this little warren of streets. And then you had other little pockets of housing as well. And I, as I said, um, earlier, I think it's that kind of sense of these isolated bits of housing has continued really. And speaking to some people in the community that, you know, some of the estates that the um, uh, Savona and Patmore feeling, well, they weren't, didn't have easy access to, 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 to shops really. I think there's just, there's just a convenience sort of store. So to, to start to unlock some of that, you know, some, 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 uh, pat, you know, some ways of getting close, you know, being able to to get to the new Waitrose or to, you know, that unlocking those areas will really start to make the fit, the, those parts of, of, of Nine Elms feel part of the wider Nine Elms Battersea community. Um, so I think, yeah, it has been just the, the, the density of the, the, the railway lines and the industry that was about around there really created these little, almost like silos or islands where people felt quite, you know, isolated from other parts of the, the wider community. Yes, and obviously now a great opportunity um, starting to unlock with the, these opening up of these connections and of course the new tube station coming in as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Game, game changing again. We've had a, an, 
a really interesting question um, from the audience for James, which really follows on um, very well from uh, Hilaire's reflections there, which is about your process, James, um, your creative process, um, and how for Projects Office, um, how you evaluate where you start from, I, the sort of the space and the very specific technical uh, pragmatic needs or more of the social context where you're sort of starting point, how you weave those, those two things together? Well, we, um, we don't have a sort of set method of working. Um, I mean, we call our practice ethos fantastic pragmatism. Um, so it really is about um, kind of balancing a sort of a pragmatic real world approach with sort of elements of, of fun or fantasy or playfulness um, and we think that sort of the the everyday is is quite fantastic and and um, we we get excited about that um, it really varies from project to project um, and it really depends at which point the the kind of engagement comes as well um, so some of our projects we might design actually an engagement approach as the starting point and from workshops or, uh, or activities that we, we, we do with stakeholders or user groups, um, that might then generate um, a kind of a narrative. Um, and that's certainly been the case for the sort of the healthcare work that we've done for the NHS, where actually the, the kind of the narrative that, that drives the project has sort of been co-created with the stakeholders. Um, Projects that are competitions are, are different because um, you don't get to talk to the stakeholders at the initial stage. Instead, um, you, you have to kind of come up with a, with a narrative approach and then you bring the engagement in later on. So in the case of this project, we were sort of really just looking at, looking at the area, thinking about the kind of the character of the area. We then got quite excited looking at old maps and, and how it has changed sort of through the years. And I think that in this case, we were we were sort of interested in these sort of very distinct identities, um, sort of from being the, the market gardens, the, the place in London to grow asparagus, the famous Battersea bundle of asparagus, all the way through to kind of the really heavy industry. Um, and then the sort of the isolated or kind of the island type communities in that in that phase. And then through to sort of the, the 1960s and 70s, where it sort of becomes kind of light industrial, there's sort of lots of depots, Christie's. And then again, it's had this sort of really dramatic kind of development into this new regeneration area. And kind of through all of that, it was just that the railway was this kind of one consistent element. And we just thought that it had to be about the railway. Uh, the site is the railway. The narrative should be the railway as well and and that was how we worked with with this project um i mean i can go on and on but um obviously there are sort of dealing with lots of constraints this project has a lot of technical constraints which i think actually we quite enjoy um so sort of from the kind of structural and safety point of view working with with network work rail that's actually really quite interesting sort of kind of getting our heads around the kind of the engineering aspects of, of the project um and i think we we want to sort of all of these constraints kind of add ri richness to the design. So um, it sort of it 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 can make it difficult for a while, but then actually it, it's always an opportunity to kind of improve and, and add detail and richness into into the final outcome. So I think we really enjoy all of those different aspects. Is that fantastic pragmatism? That the yeah, I think that's a good life. <laughs> that's a good life strategy. I might <laughs> not that one as a as a personal motto. Yes. Um, it's so, so much of what we've been talking about um, this lunchtime is around this connectivity and legibility, um, and it sort of occurs to me one of the things that's about both connect connectivity or historically very much about uh, connectivity and very legible, certainly from the from the air, is of course the Thames. Um, and I know there's a, a new pier being built, or I'm not sure if it's it's open yet um, to allow river boats to, to come into this area for connectivity. And there's much more access to that waterfront than there, there ever has been. And I think there's wider plans. I wonder, Ravi, if you could sort of 
talk a little bit about that sort of attitude to the the Thames as a as a as a route and and, and people moving along it or being able to access it and maybe Hilaire you could also give us some of the historic attitudes to it because it felt historically it sort of slightly turned its back on it uh, at some point. Well let me say that Thames when I first moved into into Wandsworth nearly 50 years ago now the the Thames between Vauxhall and Chelsea Bridges was not accessible you could not get to it because the land between Nine Arms Lane and the river was occupied by industries and warehouses and so on. You couldn't look at the river. The only way you saw the river on south side was by going to the north. So in a sense, the fact that we will now have a riverside walk almost all the way from Bonsall Bridge to Chelsea Bridge and link up with Batsy Park itself is, is, a, is a great, great achievement. And, and of course, the communities south of the railway line remained cut off. If they wanted to get to the river, they had to take a kind of a roundabout way of getting to the river. And it was never something that was, it was near yet so far kind of situation. So of course these Arch 42 and Thessaly Road Bridge and all of those will make that river much, much more accessible. I think the other thing that there will be two piers. I mean, there's one at St. George's Wharf and there's one at Bassey Power Station, both actually operational and a new public park right in front of that power station, uh, which is a huge space that again, once previously not accessible, now accessible. And when the cranes that used to be the jetty on the jetty get restored and returned, it will both provide the link with the past and yet be a, a bit of a sculptural interest on the river. The, the jetty area is already a kind of recreational space on the river uh, and so you're almost like a like a fixed pontoon in the river um, and the, the the various houseboats at river light quarter uh, river light uh, uh, development are a part they again bring back bring the community to it so that that barge community was cut off and aloof and almost secluded now you can walk past it and peer into into their way of life uh, maybe they don't welcome it but in a sense it does connect the Londoner with its with, with, with their with their great sort of binding force which is the Thames. Yeah absolutely I remember growing up in the 80s our Sunday treat was a bike ride in Battersea Park and you were very much stuck in the That's right. yeah. 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 yeah very little you could do uh, get to outside of it. Hilaire yeah. could you tell us a little bit about how that sort of maybe came about and uh what, what the context right. was. So, I mean, before before the railways arrived, so, I mean, that the, um, the London and uh, the Southampton to Nine Elms line was the first line through Battersea. And before that, that the stretch of the river along between Vauxhall and what is now Chelsea Bridge, a lot of that was, there were wharves and there was some small industry there, but there was also, there, there was a, uh, I think there was a little bit of housing on that side. So Nine Elms Station was actually on the south side of Nine Elms, Nine Elms Lane. Um, and so then the only way for people to travel on from there was by horse and carriage or by boat. So there were, there was quite a, a lot along the river that, that was, uh, there was some, a little bit of industry, but there were also wharves and places that boats could 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 um, could land. So I think with the then with the gradual and before yes, yeah, so even before then there was a lot because the because of the um, the river the soil around that area was very rich. So as James alluded to, there was you know um, asparagus grown. There was a lot of um, quite a lot of fruit and so on as well, particularly grown and and um, willow. So for for basket making, osiers, particularly at the Nine Arms end. Um, but then as the, the railway arrived and then more goods were coming in and the, 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 uh, the, the, the riverfront started to become more used more, much more for industry. So yes, definitely by, I think certainly by the time that the Ponton estate was being built and, and after that very much it, was, it, it would have been hard to get actually to the riverfront for ordinary people by then. It's fascinating and sort of changing attitudes to, to, the, to the river or rivers generally and, and, and this river specifically and really um, I think across London seeing how people are connecting back into it and using it much more as a kind of uh, connector both as a pedestrian but also on those road breaks is, is really great. Um, we're drawing 
uh, near to the end of our time. And I, I wanted to um, give each of the, our panelists an opportunity to kind of give their hopes and aspirations um, for this project and uh, what it might bring to the, to the uh, area um, and to the residents and uh, how it might sort of move on uh, once it's opened up um, into the later stages of it, its, uh, its life. Hilaire, do you want to start with a kind of historic, maybe, or a residence uh, set of aspirations and hopes for it? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I suppose I, I am excited about it, the, the arch opening up now that I'm not, and I did a little recce to find out where exactly it is. So that was quite, quite exciting to, to see on both sides. And at the moment, yes, yeah, so it's a bit of a walk around. So we'll make that um, walking through the area um, much easier. And the, the, the arrival of the tube obviously is another key factor in, in, in enabling that to happen. And uh, I mean, I've always, you know, felt that I'm fairly close into central London anyway, but for a lot of people, it's the, the tube is a kind of like, if you're not near a tube station, for some people think, you, you know, you're not in civilization almost. So, so that will make a difference as well. And hopefully it will start to really bring the different parts of, of this, this triangle of land, the, the Nine Elms area, start to really bring them together. I'm a South East Londoner, so we're definitely a long way from civilization. <laughs> 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 uh, Ravi, what are your sort of hopes and aspirations? Well, as a South East Londoner, you have a railway line that takes you as close to Wandsworth Road, and you could then take a trip from Wandsworth Road through this area uh, in, in, into, into Nine Elms itself. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's about, we talk about the 15 minute city now, particularly in the last uh, 12, 14 months, we've started talking about this. So our ambition is to create 25,000 jobs. Well, I hope that many, many of those jobs will be taken by people in the immediate neighborhood and within, within Nine Elms and in its, in, in, in its neighborhood. So these connections are the ones that will then bring them in from home to work and back. So that kind of 15 minute city will really become alive rather than, you know, take people out of, or to bring people in from long distances. And yet those long links are also important because of the diversity of the area almost means that people are going to work in different places and, and they want to be able to come in and out. But I, I really, we're halfway through, aren't we? through this opportunity area framework period. It started in 2009 and, and, and you know, by 12, it was the plan and, and we are now nearly halfway there. A lot has been achieved, but I think the next stage is going to make sure that we bring to life this concept of living, working and playing within the same neighborhood and this, this connections making it all that much easier to do. Absolutely, and I think as you said, this connection both is a sort of short connection in the 15 minute, but it also opens up this wider connectivity, which is, is great. And Jane, sorry, we're, we're running in time, but what's your sort of hopes and aspirations? I think for me, or for us as projects of this, it's, it's all about kind of pedestrian permobility. Um, so for pedestrians and cyclists, and the idea that by opening up these routes, you, you kind of give people their city back. They give them the sense that this is, this is their land, this is their, they can go through here, it belongs to them, it's theirs. And that you start to kind of encourage people to kind of move through these places that, that previously it was just too difficult to access. And, and the fact that actually you're giving the city back and this belongs to everyone and by giving movement, you, you, you give people their, their city again. I think that's a lovely, a lovely place to stop and I think absolutely uh, right. So it just uh, really falls to me to thank everyone for joining us uh, here this lunchtime and to thank my panellists, uh, Councillor Ravi Govinda, Hilaire and James Christian from Projects Office. So thank you all three of you, it's been really fascinating um, and thank you everyone for joining us.